Hey, this is for the sisters and everybody that loves them. Be very clear, I felt like the Holy Spirit really prompted my heart uh, to teach a message in hopes that it would increase the empathy for Abigails, women who are exhausted, overextended, overwhelmed, yet unappreciated and unassisted. And so we're gonna explore the story of a woman named Abigail in the Bible. I think it's gonna help women, and I think it's gonna help those that love the women in their lives. Enjoy the message. Man, so, so grateful. And we're excited about all that God's doing. I want to honor your time today. Um, whenever we start a little late, just know that me pastor preached a little too long at the last service. So I want to get right into this lesson. There's something on my heart. And Mother's Day is a very complex day. It's a day of mixed emotions. And for some, it's celebration. For some, it's grief. Uh, for some, it's missing a mom. And I always want to pray through Lord, how do I steward this moment? How do I best serve the people you're going to put me in front of? And today there's something that just really arrested my heart. And uh, I want us to look at a story in the book of 1 Samuel chapter number 25. And I want to read a couple of verses and we're going to jump right into the lesson. And it reads like this. Verse 32 says, David said to Abigail, praise be to the Lord, the God of Israel, who has sent you today to meet me. May you be blessed for your good judgment and for keeping me from bloodshed this day and from avenging myself with my own hands. Otherwise, as surely as the Lord lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive by daybreak. Then David accepted from her hand what she had brought him and said, go home in peace. I have heard your words and granted your request. Now, I know what service I'm at. This is the 115. This is my fourth time preaching this today. But I know what service I'm at. And I'm gonna see if y'all with me. I need a good strong 25 minutes, but I wanna see if y'all with me today. Here's the topic of today's teaching. I'm going to see if this is the 115. Help a sister out. <laughs> that, okay, we all right, we all right. Family, I want to leap into this lesson today by exploring a term that has become increasingly interesting, yet culturally controversial. And the term is captured in two words, family. It's a term called soft life. <laughs> and although I am unaware of the exact origin of this concept, and I am aware that this concept has been co-opted by extremism. To my knowledge, this concept, though, in its purest form, is simply a call to women from women to resist and reject the notion that struggle, stress, and strain should be a social norm for the sister. A soft life in its purest form is not some naive notion that life will be easy, but it is a healthy hypothesis that life doesn't have to be this hard. The concept of a soft life is not a suggestion that women don't want to do anything, but rather they simply don't want to have to do everything. It is a recognition that people have admiration for traits that some women possess that those women who possess them wish they didn't have to have. It is as if some sisters would suggest that you are admiring me for something I wish I didn't have to be. We admire women for being strong, not realizing and recognizing that strength is not always their preference. Strength for many of them is a necessity. They're not strong because they wanted to be. They're strong because they had to be. They're strong because they wouldn't have survived if they weren't strong. 
They're strong because they would not have advanced if they were not strong. They're strong because they had to carry things. They never thought that they would have to carry. And some of them didn't know how much strength they had until they hit a season and a situation that required them to reach down in the reservoir of their spiritual and emotional well and pull out strength to carry what they didn't expect to have to carry. We often admire them because of their ability to multitask, not realizing and recognizing that that skill is not always a preference. It's a necessity. We applaud them because of their resilience and resolve and their ability to be able to push through and to press through and not stop when they deal with sickness. Not realizing that the reason that they don't stop when they're sick is not because they don't want to stop. It's not because they don't need to stop. It's because they know everything will stop if they stop. So they keep on going. And therefore, it is easy for sisters to find themselves in seasons and in situations where they are overwhelmed, overextended, and exhausted without the proper amount of empathy. What do you do when you're overwhelmed, overextended, and exhausted, and the people that exhausted you don't have empathy for you? Where is the 115 today? Consequently, the desire for a soft life is simply some sisters sagaciously suggesting, help a sister out. And this text that we just read in your hearing here in the book of Samuel is an amazing example of what I'm trying to articulate. This story introduces us to an asset in the form of a woman named Abigail. Listen to me. And Abigail is not an asset just because she's a woman. Abigail is an asset, listen to me, because of the kind of woman she is. Because the Bible teaches that every kind isn't the same kind. Woo! Now, there is a person in the Bible who would know. He's not a woman, but he dealt with enough of them to know a little bit about him. And his name was Solomon. Well, my Bible readers. And here's what he said in Proverbs chapter number 14, verse number one. He says, the wise woman builds her house. But the foolish one tears hers down. Notice the dichotomy. One's wise, one's foolish. The wise one is constructive. The foolish one is destructive. The wise one is an asset. The foolish one is a liability. Every kind isn't the same kind. And so when we talk about Abigail, we're talking about a woman of wisdom. Listen to how the Bible describes Abigail. I I love it here. I love this description. And one more time, just the 115. So y'all can handle this. Here it is. I I love this description of Abigail because this description of Abigail debunks some dichotomies that people think they have to live with because of what we see in culture. The, The description of Abigail debunks the myth that you have to be this or that. Abigail's description shows us you can be this and that. Here it is. The text says, watch this, 1 Samuel 25, 3, it says that Nabal's wife's name was Abigail. Watch this. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman. Did you hear that? She had beauty and brains. 
She was not this or that. She was this and that. She is an example of an ambidextrous woman. She's an example of a woman who can do multiple things. She is one who can bring home the bacon and then fry the bacon. Come on. And I want to know, am I talking to any ambidextrous women today that will say, I can do both? <laughs> yeah, when I walk in the room, I'm not just a looker, I'm a lifter. Things are going to be lifted in the room. Family, this is Abigail. She is externally attractive, but she's intellectually valuable. When she shows up, help shows up. She is the personification of God's intention for the woman revealed in Genesis chapter number 2, verse 18, when it says, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. This statement has implications beyond Abigail. Adam. It is not just suggesting that Adam needed Eve. It was suggesting that the human species needed a woman. It is God looking at Adam say, I gave you an assignment in the earth that cannot be accomplished without somebody who's got something I didn't give you. So he put Adam to sleep as an anesthesiologist and then he reached into Adam as a surgeon and pulled out a rib and then he fashioned an Isha called Eve and when she walked into Adam's presence. Adam said, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. So when Eve showed up, help showed up. When Eve walked in, help walked in. And I want to know, am I talking to any sisters that understand the assignment? When you understand your assignment to be an asset, your declaration will be, if you don't want help, don't call me. because I didn't walk in the room just to be cute and to look and to be quiet. I came in the room to add value. I came in the room to release some wisdom. I came in the room to unleash a gift. I came in the room to tear Satan's kingdom upside down. I can do more than carry a baby. I can carry a dream. As a matter of fact, I can carry twins because I can carry your dream and mine and give birth to both of them. <laughs> Abigail is an asset. Here's her issue. This might not be your issue, but here's Abigail's issue. It might not be your issue, but it's Abigail's issue. Here's the issue. Abigail is an asset, but she's connected to a liability. <laughs> Pastor, where'd you get that from? The Bible. I, 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 got it. I got it from I got it from the Bible. Pastor, what do you mean? What do you mean? You, well, you see, I want you to see how the Bible describes Abigail one more time. It says she's an intelligent and beautiful woman. Do you see that? Is that in the text? But she was an intelligent and beautiful woman, comma. See, it's, it's the comma for me. But her husband was sur surly and mean in his dealings. She's beautiful and intelligent, and her husband has this unhealthy concoction because he's unaware you shouldn't be both of these. You can't be unattractive and unkind, brother. You can't. You don't look good enough to be mean, Nabal. You got just, it'll help you if you just get nice. Just, just talk nice, Nabal. Some of you who may be familiar with this story, you may be saying, Pastor, what do you mean? She's married to a liability. She's connected to a liability. Nabal was an extremely wealthy man. I didn't say he didn't have assets. I'm saying he wasn't an asset. I'm saying you are not what you have. 
Nabal was extremely successful, but he failed to understand that success is simply overachievement in one area. It does not always translate to all areas. Therefore, we need to be conscious and careful when it comes to who we receive wisdom from because just because they're winning in one area does not mean they got wisdom to speak into your life in another area. And some of us are in a season where your choices are so consequential that you've got to be uniquely discriminatory and selective when it comes to who you allow to speak into to your life your choices are too consequential for you to be cloudy and for you to be misguided with the misinformation because the principle of proclamation says whoever has your ear has your future Nabal was rich in resources but he was poor in wisdom And this is a dangerous place to be because his problem was, his problem wasn't rather that he didn't know where he was rich. His problem was he didn't know where he was poor. He knew where he was rich, but he didn't know where he was poor. Lord, I don't have time to deal with this. Because when you have overachievement in one area, It can produce the trappings of success in other areas. So there is the shadow of success, but not the substance of success. Woof, right? So, 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 come on. The, 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 his success in the marketplace could, uh, could give him options relationally. Come on. And he could take advantage of the options and because he had income, watch this, he could take advantage of the options and because he had income, he could live an opulent lifestyle. And people could look at the opulence in the relationship and assume that's a great relationship when it is a shadow of one, but it is not the substance of one. Are you here? I said, are you here? Yeah. So, so it's, it's like this overachievement in some area. It can be deceptive because you can be winning so well in one area that you see the fruit of those winnings in other areas. And you can think you just as good in those areas. Wow. Come on. Come on. And it becomes uniquely complicated when the people that are surrounded, that are surrounding you, Their well-being is at the mercy of your continued success. Therefore, the more successful you are, the less likely they are to speak truth to you. I don't have. We got to go to brunch. Come on. <laughs> so, so he's rich, but he doesn't know where he's poor in. He's rich in one area, but he doesn't know where he's poor in because he's so rich in that area, no one would tell him he's poor in another one. Here it is, and here's what's the problem. Here's the problem. When you don't know where you're poor, you won't know where to partner. Did you hear what I just said? I said when you don't know where you're poor, then you don't, want to, you don't know where to partner because you need to partner with someone who is rich where you're poor. Not only will you not know where to partner, you won't know who to partner with. And you can have an Abigail in your life that you are underutilizing. Because if you can't see your poverty, then you can't see her wealth. And if you can't see her wealth, you won't position her to release her wealth into your life. And what happened with Nabal is this. Y'all all right? Do I have eight, nine minutes? Do I have it? Okay. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. I want you to see what happens because Nabal's poverty gets them in a predicament that his wealth can get them out of. The area he was poor in gets them in a predicament that the area he was rich in can't get them out of. Pastor, where you get that from? The Bible. 
Because when you read this story, you'll see that Nabal's success was in the area of agriculture. So primarily, the text says he has thousands of sheep. Now, sheep or animals during that day, that was a form of currency. That was an asset. And thieves are always after assets. So during these days, they aren't stealing credit card numbers. There are no bank accounts. They had to steal something substantive. So if sheep were a means of currency, then what would it mean? It means raiders would come and try to kill shepherds so they can take the sheep. So Nabal had thousands of sheep and some of his sheep were spread out in this region where David, who defeated Goliath with a rock, David, who defeated a lion and a bear with his bare hands, David, who was one of the most successful military leaders during the rule of King Saul. This David just happened to be in an area where Nabal's sheep and shepherds were. And you know what David did? Him and his men protected them. Even though he didn't know him. Even though he didn't need him. They protected them. And listen to what happens. There comes a season where it was time to shear the sheep. And they're shearing the sheep and Nabal's preparing a feast of food for all of the shepherds. And David sends word to Nabal, hey, we protected your sheep and your shepherds. You wouldn't have so many sheep to shear if it wasn't for our protection. But Nabal's intoxicated with arrogance and arrogance gives you selective amnesia. Selective amnesia is when you remember everything you did for others, but you forget what others have done for you. And, and, so, and so David says, hey, can you just take whatever you can find in terms of food and just send some up here so I can feed my men? That's all he asks. I want you to see Nabal's response. <laughs> Verse 9 says, when, when David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name. Then they waited. And Nabal answered David's servants, who is this David? Who is this son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and meat I have slaughtered for my shearers and give it to men coming from who knows where? That's what he said to David's men. So verse 12 says, David's men turned around and went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word. I mean, they got detailed. He said, who is this David? Who is this Jesse? I think he don't like your mama. I think he don't like your cousins. The text says they reported every word. Watch what David does, family. David said to his men, listen, each one of you, strap on your sword. So they did, and David strapped on his as well, and about 400 men went up with David. Now this same David that defeated Goliath, same David that defeated a lion and a bear with his, with his bare hands, is on his way to annihilate Nabal's house. Nabal's poverty has put his family in jeopardy and his wealth can't rectify it. Did you hear what I just said? But one of the servants in Nabal's camp had enough sense to say in a predicament like this, there's only one person I know that's got the weapon called wisdom to get us out of here. Y'all missed it. They worked for Nabal, but the servant had enough sense to know where the wisdom was. Y'all aren't talking to me. I said he worked for Nabal, but he had enough sense to know where the wisdom was. He said, Nabal got us in it, but there's only one person I know that can get us out of it. And he ran to Abigail, Nabal's wife.
Did you hear what I just said? And they said to Abigail, David sent messages from the wilderness to give our master greetings, but he hurled insults at them. Yet these men were very good to us. They did not mistreat us. And the whole time we were out in the fields near them, nothing was missing. Night and day, they were a wall around us. And the whole time we were herding our sheep near them. Now think over what you can do because disaster is hanging over our master and his whole household. He is such a wicked man that no one can talk to him. This is what he tell Abigail because he knows right now the weapon we need is wisdom. And I got to go to the one not who's got the title. I got to go to the one who's got the wisdom. I got to go to the one not who's got the notoriety, but to the one who's got the wisdom. I got to go to the one, watch this, that may not get all the credit, but she's got the competence to get us out of this crisis. He went to Abigail and that sister Abigail said, uh, y'all, okay. Let me tell you, y'all not ready for this. Uh, uh-huh. Verse 18 says this. I love the first three words. Abigail acted quickly. I'm going to say it again. Abigail acted quickly. I'm going to say it again. Abigail acted quickly. Now, this seems inconsequential unless you go back to our foundational text where the Bible records David responding to Abigail and says in verse 34, otherwise, as surely as the Lord God of Israel lives, who has kept me from harming you, if you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been alive by daybreak. He said if it would have took me all night to do it, I was going to annihilate everybody connected to him. But you came to me quickly. If you had delayed, if you had waited, you would have got to me too late. And sometimes sister's intuition is actually divine urgency. God saying, do it now. Move now. Come on here. That sister acted quickly. What'd she do, pastor? She went to that cabinet, opened it up, pulled out those plastic bags from Publix that she didn't throw away, went in that pantry, started pulling stuff out the pantry, put it in the plastic bag, walking fast through the house going outside, heading toward the donkey. Now here come the servants want to help and grab some of the bags and she said, leave me alone because now all of a sudden you want to be helpful and resourceful. Where were you on the front end? I got to fix this on the back end. Leave me alone. That sister puts the bags on the donkey. She rides the donkey by herself to meet King David and when she gets in David's presence, This is what she says. I'm just reading the Bible. We're getting out of here now. I'm just, here's what she said. She says, please pay no attention. This is what she says to David. Pay no attention, my Lord, to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name means fool. (laughs) And folly goes with him. Now, that's my husband, so I'm going to stick beside him. I'm going to stick beside him. But, but, but his name, his name means fool. As for me, your servant, I didn't see the men that my Lord sent. And now, as surely as the Lord, your God lives, and as you live, since the Lord has kept you from bloodshed and avenging yourself with your own hands, may your enemies and all who are intent on harming my Lord be like Nabal and let this gift which your servant has brought to my Lord be given to the men who follow you. Now let's make a hermeneutical loop and go back to the passage that we read as we ease into this message and verse 32 captures David's response to Abigail. He says praise be to the Lord the God of Israel who has sent you today to meet me. Y'all missed it. When you read the text, it just looked like she went. But David said, God sent. Because sometimes you're, sometimes obeying your intuition is actually following a divine prompting. 
Y'all missed it. That God was working through the instinct of a woman. The Bible didn't say she prayed and fasted. It says she acted quickly because God was working through her instinct. Y'all better come get me today. Am I talking to any woman in the room that knows God's given you instinct? The text says, praise be to the God of Israel who has sent you to me. Now watch what he says. May you be blessed for your good judgment. Because you have kept me from bloodshed today and avenging myself with my own hands. I don't have time. We got to go. I don't have time. Because if I had time, I would show you where Nabal has no idea he is dealing with a man whose moral restraint is waning because David has already restrained himself from taking out Saul when he had an opportunity to take out the one that had taken him out. Instead of taking him out, he cuts off a part of his cloak and says, you know what? I'm not going to do it because I'm not going to touch the Lord. I could, but I won't. But it took some out of me when I didn't. Let me go over here. I could, but I won't. But it took some out of me when I didn't. So I don't know here how many more times. Let, where's my honesty? I'm trying to do the best I can, but Lord, I don't know. I just feel a one more time in my flesh, not in my spirit. I got I, you. Got one. And Nabal messed with David at the wrong time. He's getting ready to avenge himself. And he says to Abigail, you stop me from avenging myself with my own hands. He says, otherwise, as sure as the Lord lives, who has kept me from harming you. He kept me from harming you. He has kept me from harming you. If you had not come quickly to meet me, not one male belonging to Nabal would have been left alive. And David accepted from her hand what she brought him. And he says these words. And 115, you are not allowed to shout when I share this. Shouting is illegal for the next 15 seconds. He said to her, go home in peace. You came stressed but you're going home in peace. You came with anxiety, but you're going home in peace. You came worried, but you're going home in peace. You rode out here fast, but you can ride back slow. He said, don't stress. I'm done talking, y'all, don't stress. Go home in peace. An entire disaster is averted and avoided because of a woman's intervention. Now, I was telling Pastor Shamika in the back, I can't even really pull out of this text what could be pulled out of this text with men in the room. I can't. I don't even. I couldn't. Nah. Nah. No, you can't. You can't. <laughs> you can't handle it. What do you do when you have to submit to somebody you wiser than? I see. That's what I told you. You want? That's. I just. I need a. I don't know. You need to let me speak at the next women something. Let me. Let me deal with that. Disaster is avoided because a woman has to take action she couldn't even tell Nabal about. Because he would probably have disallowed her from doing something that actually saved the family.
So she was not acting in rebellion. She was submitting to her highest authority. Because whenever your delegated authority contradicts your highest authority, now you have to submit to the higher authority. This too much, we gotta go. Because if the delegated authority contradicts the higher authority, God, and you obey the delegated authority, now you've committed idolatry. <laughs> Let's go. Tario, play. <laughs> We got to go. I got family in town. We got to go. Here it is. Here it is. <laughs> Tario, I'm in authority. Play. <laughs> the whole family avoided disaster because of the intervention of a woman. She gets very little credit. Many people are unfamiliar with her story because we don't talk about Abigail. But all of us are here because in one way or another and Abigail used a weapon called wisdom to help us. Now, do you think a woman like that is a gift from God? Do you think God wants us to properly steward and take care of gifts like that? The question is how? And the answer is twofold. You got to ask her. <laughs> and then secondly, you got to ask the one who made her. Because the one who made her may tell you something she can't. Because some of them have gone without a need met so long, they don't even know how to name the need. So God has to tell you how to give them what they can't name because they've never had it. So I can't tell you what she could say, but I could share with you some things I think the maker would say. R.C. Sproul says we cannot read God's mind, but we can read his word. So here it is, family. Five things really quick. Number one for my note takers. What should I do with Abigail? How can I help a sister out? Number one, affirm Abigail. Affirmation is an indication that you properly perceived her value. I'm not talking about feeling gratitude. I'm talking about expression, expressing appreciation. Proverbs 31, 28 says, uh, for the virtuous woman, her children rise and call her blessed, and her husband also praises her. Affirm Abigail. Number two, advocate for Abigail. Abigail is often helping other people give birth to their dreams and very rarely are people helping her give birth to hers. <laughs> Abigail can speak up for herself, but she shouldn't have to speak up for herself all the time. Yeah. Number three, assist Abigail. This means accurately identifying the season she's in and discerning the support that season requires. <laughs> Baby, where, mom, sister, wife, where are you now? Because I don't want to give you what you used to need. Number four, accept Abigail. Abigail needs to be received for who she is, not just for who she's not. Because some of the things that agitate you about her is what makes her an asset to you. You so detailed, that's why our bills together. <laughs> Y'all are talking to me. She needs to be encouraged to grow into a better version of herself, but not pressured to become someone she's not. Acceptance is not an excuse to stay stuck in dysfunction, but rather it's an acknowledgement that you are loved in spite of it. And the things that others judge, I am here to heal. 
And last but not least, assure Abigail. Just because Abigail is strong doesn't mean she doesn't feel insecure. There are times when adversity creates amnesia and Abigail forgets who she are, who she is. And she needs somebody to remind her, you steal her. All this message is about, it's about a biblical concept called stewardship. That when God blesses you, he often blesses you in the form of people. And we are to steward those people well. And recognize when God's giving you a different kind. It's an Abigail who needs to be treated that way. Father, would you give us the wisdom and the courage and the wherewithal to properly steward and handle the Abigails you have sent into our life. And I pray for every exhausted Abigail that you, oh God, would renew her strength. In Jesus' name, amen.